What's going on, guys? It's Frito here for your Overwatch Big News Roundup today. Jeff Kaplan has been all over the place talking about Overwatch 1 and 2. Some leaks of new events have surfaced as well as, especially with a new patch coming around, thought it was a good time to bring back a bunch of community news. So a jam-packed one today, starting off with Game Informer, who asked Jeff Kaplan 110 rapid fire questions. And this was a fun interview, but of course gonna be a lot of filler in between. So I'm gonna pick out some of the key things Jeff said as it applies to Overwatch 1, as well as further explanation on the sequel. So a bombshell that was laden in here is that they're happy with role queue overall, but they have some great improvements coming. Based on the structure of this interview, there isn't really any time to expand. So we don't know what that might be. A lot of players, especially high ranked DP PS players would love the ability to get a priority queue, which essentially would mean that they would be allowed to fill for a game or even a certain number of games in order to get a guaranteed queue into damage. Because of course, right now, the way the system works is anybody can just wait in line for damage. And if you want to play it, there is no way to incentivize filling, essentially. It's something we lost when roll queue came out, that players that maybe want to lean towards a certain role, but are willing to fill to get into games faster. Now it's sort of a binary where you're either never playing damage or you have to wait forever, especially at the high ranks. So I'd expect a change to that because otherwise I think the system works decently well. Tank queues are the most effective currently, but that might just be a meta concern. And obviously something that they directly addressed with the new PTR patch that we should expect to come next Tuesday, making all the tanks much more lethal and fun and less about being barrier bots. Other cool things, Jeff said that they have thought about allowing players to customize the communication wheel options, and the thing that the interviewer suggested was like return to the payload, but I think there's many communication options that we would like to see, but I assume that would take a bit of work considering that they have unique voice lines for some of those. But with all this, whenever we talk about new content, it's important for us to translate the language that Jeff uses because they're usually pretty deliberate on the word choice. So in this instance, he says, we have thought about allowing players to customize the communications wheel, which means they probably have yet to put any work into it, but it's on the table. Another question, would we ever see a universal Overwatch account across systems? Jeff says, we'd love to see that happen someday. I'm not sure if this is a PR answer, because if you think about it, if a dedicated player buys two accounts, there's a chance that they would buy more loot boxes on their second and third account across different platforms. So it probably isn't in the business interest to allow you to share everything across all platforms, but especially as we get into other types of business models, perhaps that then would be a route they would go. We'll talk more about that in the Overwatch 2 section. The interviewer brings up the new hero Echo and sort of a call response. What does this hero, if you main them, say about you? Jeff says that it would make you mysterious, which is pretty vague and I don't think tells us anything more about Echo than we knew before, but you can add it on to all the rest of the context that we've seen in little glimpses of the new hero that we expect to come out in Overwatch 2, because of course she was sealed away in Route 66 and McCree freed her. She's like a super AI weapon, I would say, that has technology that's probably even more advanced than the Overwatch universe. That's the vibe I get. That's down the lines of what I expect out of Echo. Other things that Jeff drops, more Shimada characters should be on the way, not just Genji, and Hanzo, there might be more family members that potentially use a gun. When asked about a console PTR, Jeff said that they would only consider it if it didn't slow down the patching process, which basically means no, because in order to run that kind of thing on consoles, it would both take longer, and depending on the agreements with the platforms themselves, sometimes patching the game costs the company, so there isn't much of an incentive for developers to push it to those platforms just so that they can patch the game multiple times and then have to pay each time to do so when they can gather their data on their own platforms with Battle.net and do it for free. When asked about the archives missions, Jeff explains that they will be viable again in some capacity, which is to say, I'm not actually sure if they're coming back to Overwatch 1 in their regular scheduled event date. I assume they would be. I think more so what he means here, when Overwatch 2 comes out, they're looking for a way to incorporate that old PvE gameplay into the new PvE, but that one's a little bit confusing for me. Now, let's move on to talking about things he said about Overwatch 2 specifically. And again, we're going to pay close attention to some of the word choice used in this, where he says here, Overwatch 1 players will play with Overwatch 2 in core 
competitive modes. I don't know if this is a mistake by him or actually deliberate on purpose because obviously there's arcade and workshop and other modes. Is he implying that there won't be crossplay between those modes? You would think so. Or is that something that they'll add later and they're focusing on the core modes first? It's hard to say, but it also could mean that Overwatch 2 could have a separate set of arcade modes. It's all really blurry at this point, so who knows? But if you take that one as a negative, this next one is a pretty big positive. He says that we are very interested in crossplay, something we're doing a lot of exploration around. Now, I take this to mean that they're actively working on crossplay. And something that I've been thinking about more and more when it comes to Overwatch 2 and how awkward it seems, something that especially us PC gamers forget is that there's a brand new console generation around the corner and Overwatch 2 with the way its development cycle and potential release date seems to be is going to be in sync with the PS5 and the new Xbox. So because of this, for me, it sort of lines up a lot of potential answers to these weird questions where, sure, he's talking about cross-play, but really, I almost expect it to be cross-generation. Because how else would any of the other promises make sense, right? If he says that you can play core modes, Overwatch 1 to Overwatch 2, to combine the player base, and the sequel, I think it's safe to expect at this point, is going to be on the next-gen consoles, well, there won't be an Overwatch 1 on the PS5, for example, I would imagine, right? You want to keep up with Overwatch, you got to get the sequel, which has all the old stuff as well as the new. I don't even know if this is possible. I'm just one gamer nerd talking into a mic, following the breadcrumbs of these conversations. So you guys will let me know in the comments if what I'm saying doesn't even make any sense or isn't possible. But I think it's pretty likely that we could see the player bases getting combined in multiple ways, especially with the conversations of the next gen systems having that inherently anyway. Not all the companies agree, of course, to allow cross play with different platforms, but it would be a great thing if we could get all Overwatch players playing together, at least in the casual modes, right? New games like the new Modern Warfare I know does this. Fortnite has been doing it for a while. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. And especially if they say they're interested in doing it, I think that means they're actively developing it. Other tidbits about Overwatch 2, Jeff says that progression maybe won't be in the regular story, but just in the hero missions, which I think adds some important context to the gameplay we should expect from Overwatch 2's story, which is to say it probably just feels like a normal shooter campaign, and all the replayability and RPG mechanics might only exist in the grindable, infinitely replayable hero missions. But as Jeff said, that's subject to change, just something to think about. Next, he says that Overwatch 1 players who are in a PvP match will see the upgraded looks, but not be able to select them themselves. This answer about the upgraded graphics, I feel we've heard explained differently a handful of times. So according to Jeff in this interview, if the enemy has a Overwatch 2 Lucio, that's what you'll see. But if you don't have Overwatch 2, you can't select the new upgraded graphics. So with this, I assume only the heroes got a big graphical overhaul and the map design more or less would stay the same because otherwise these rules, I don't think make as much sense. When asked about split screen, Jeff Kaplan said that it's highly unlikely. And last up, Jeff explains that they have yet to pick a business model for the new game. So we don't know if it's going to consist of loot boxes, but based on what they're saying, if they were happy with the way loot boxes work, they would just say loot boxes again. But seeing as that progression has kind of fallen off and perhaps could get outlawed one day, you'd expect that Overwatch 2 would consist of something different. Jeff Kaplan also gave a talk at the University of Southern California and Jaru Pants, who attended the talk and live tweeted some of the key things Jeff said with some pretty important information, saying they're going to start rethinking the event calendar and possibly retiring some events. He thinks Overwatch 2 should bring in more new events, but you should expect a sort of Sid Meier's rule of thirds, where a third of the content will be new, a third the same, and a third improved. Unclear if this is something we have to worry about in the near future, with Overwatch 2 being years away, potentially, but it makes us wonder what we're going to be getting in that time. I think you'd expect it's fairly easy for them to maintain what they've already been doing, which is to say not much, just reusing the things they've already made with some new skins. So I think the seasonal events are definitely not going to change, but we should expect more on the story events, which actually we'll speak about more in a little bit. But more from Jeff at the University of Southern California. He talks about balance and the PTR and notes that it's hard to get any useful data 
on the PTR whatsoever because so few players have played it. The concurrent player peak was only 60,000 and that was for roll queue. And also other things that we already know, the player psychology on PTR is different. They don't play properly, which pretty much just gives further evidence of things we've already known about the PTR. They don't really use it to balance because there's no data to be received really. Unless something seems egregiously wrong onto the PTR, that's why like Moira being able to fade even after being stunned as if she wasn't going to be strong enough in that patch, that kind of thing they did remove, but usually they stick to their guns on whatever changes they put through because not a lot of great testing gets done on the PTR. He makes a comment about balance as an idea and says people think that if they have the statistics, they can balance, but balance is an art, not a science. It's more than that. And to this degree, Jeff's absolutely right, but I don't even know if they necessarily follow this because, for example, so many times have we seen characters that have, quote, low pick rates get buffed in such a way that ruins the entire balance of the game. For example, I tried to be the boy who cried wolf when everyone was clamoring for Reaper to be some competitive character, and look where we are now. The game feel and game play is way more important than trying to get all the statistics to line up. The worst thing they can do is try to make easy characters perform better in pick rates through stats. When you make something skillful effective, it's far less damaging because not everybody can execute that skill, right? Whereas if the barrier to entry to access that power gets empowered, then why wouldn't people just take the path of least resistance to power, right? That's not what we want, but yet that's something that I feel like they've done time and time again. But moving on, let's now talk about new events that were most likely leaked by Compay on Twitter, who found this unreleased screenshot of two new upcoming events, Brigitte's Helmet Heart Challenge and Zenyatta's Iris Challenge. Some disagreement on whether this is real or fake because of course Brigitte has her name spelled wrong, but a lot of us were skeptical of the Overwatch 2 leaks because they looked a little dodgy as well. I think it's safe to say that internal images at Blizzard are more likely to have errors in them because they're not ready to go live anyway. They're not supposed to be leaked. So I'm leaning towards this probably being true to be honest because instead of doing much with the seasonal events, what they have been doing is adding these lore events which allow you to get a new custom skin i actually like these a lot better i think judging by the amount of attention that they can bring to the seasonal events like if it's going to be low right i think it's a lot easier in a direct route to them to provide value to the players to have a cool skin you can play for as well as actually good lore additions rather than a lackluster addition to lucio ball or something i'd say you might as well leave that alone and do something well because i think these have been a huge success now according to the leaks we should expect Brigida's helmet heart challenge to come in february 2020 and then zenyatta's iris challenge later in june including a human zenyatta skin i mean that's probably one of the biggest announcements in this because it probably relates to some wacky lore. How does Zenyatta have a human form? This has major implications to the lore of Overwatch and could mean a lot of things. Was Zen a human before he got transferred his consciousness or something into being an Omnic? Or is it possible for Omnix to make some sort of Android version of a human? Either way, it's got to be kind of interesting, right? And with this, of course, there should be short stories that come along with it. The Zen one will be from Michael Chu. You'll be able to watch Twitch streamers in order to earn the new sprays, just as normal. So we can look for those to come out next year, potentially, if that leak is real. Now we're going to move on to talking about community news. A bunch of stuff that I think you'll find useful gearing up ready to play on the new patch when it should go live Tuesday, or just general information that can be quite useful. As I said in my previous video, the EU Pro players have been hosting pickup games in order to test the new patch, and so far the results look like the best Overwatch patch we've ever seen. In my video reviewing this, I was more skeptical than that, but I did jump on a call with Peak after recording my video, and he convinced me of a few things that make me a bit more optimistic. You can check out the conversation linked in the description, but some key points that I thought were fairly convincing was that he thinks that splitting up is a lot more powerful and power positions on maps actually matter now that there isn't as much insane anti-damage or sustain and because of that pure brawl playstyles don't work at least not like they used to so the cooldowns that I thought should be the strongest like halt and escapes like wraith form and cryo freeze don't matter as much because sure you can use them to go isolate one target but 
the map sort of opened up in a way where the crossfires and other damage angles get value. And if he's right on that, then Brawl would die, or at least it would be balanced. But my worry is once we see 6v6 teams really abuse pathing and teamwork to avoid some of those damage angles, just like we saw with the GOATS era, will those sustain effects still reign supreme for a lot of teams? Nobody really knows yet, which is the exciting part about this next patch. It's the best time to be an Overwatch player as we try to figure out what actually is any good. I certainly hope Peak's right. If so, we would have a very fun patch ahead of us. In any case, for the casual player base, I think the patch looks pretty good. My only real concern is that at the professional level of play in a six-man team, we're still going to see the abuse of corny strategies, but we'll have to wait and see how that all pans out on Tuesday. And with the new patch coming out, you may want to prepare for playing new heroes in the flex support slot with Moira probably being weaker. Batiste and Ana should be pretty good. And if you play those heroes, you may want to check out Blinky's video explaining the new Batiste firing style. Go to his vid for a further explanation, but in short, you used to be able to shoot a heal nade and sneak in one primary fire in between without losing efficiency on either in order to maximize that, of course, to heal a teammate and then aim and shoot at an enemy. You kind of have to be frantically aiming in two different directions, but it can be done. But now with the recent buff to Batiste's recovery rates, he actually can sneak in two shots of his primary fire to deal damage in between each shot of his heal nade. Pretty sick stuff for you Ana players. Screwed it on Reddit, made an outrageously long document explaining a ton of different on a nade positions in order to siege typical locations on the map. Of course, this combines using Darwin's on a nade tool with a lot of experimentation. And I would say if you are in on a main, even just figuring out some of these key positions that work for your games is going to provide you with a bunch of value. As Overwatch ages as a game, this type of stuff becomes more and more mainstay and will be kind of a required thing for you to learn if you want to increase your competitive potential. Other resources that that you might find useful from Reddit. Here is a chart explaining how much damage converts to 10% of ult charge for each hero. Now remember, healers can gain ult from healing as well, so this is just based on the damage they do. And characters that have really high values on this chart means that it takes much more damage in order to get that 10%. So for example, Lucio needs to deal the most 290 damage just to get 10% ult, which is why if you're trying to build ult with Lucio, it's much more efficient to heal, but speeding, doing damage, and booping is a big percentage of your gameplay as well. So that still is something that you have to balance and manage appropriately. And Tracers is the lowest at 126 damage, which with just a little bit of math wizardry, we can just times that by 10 and see that she just needs about 1200 damage dealt in order to gain a full ult. Keeping in mind there's passive generation as well. It's going to be in that range. Another resource for you, this one uploaded by Spadler on Reddit, visualizing the hitboxes. This utilizes a workshop code that outlines where the actual hitboxes of the characters are, which is pretty useful. And especially if you're struggling with a specific hero or you're losing a duel to them or feel like you can't beat them for whatever reason, I suggest you look to these hitboxes and make sure that you're abusing them. For example, Reinhardt's hammer doesn't get counted as a hitbox, but conversely, Roadhog's head is way bigger than the actual model. Same with Ash, her head hitbox seems pretty massive considering how small her head is, I've always felt that. And one recurring theme that you'll see with skinny characters or squishies is that their legs are quite often bigger. And this is something that we've said as a tip quite a long time ago, but if you aren't aiming for the head, sometimes the best place to aim is at the legs. This has been true of like shooting Farah, for example, because especially when her legs come together, it makes for a much fatter hitbox. Last few things I wanted to share with you. There is a Doomfist bug that allows his rocket punch to slant diagonally upwards, traveling up a ramp. And until they fix this, this is a pretty insane bit of Doomfist tech that you'll want to be aware of, either to use for yourself or to anticipate those wacky one-hit kills coming from around the corner. Last up for the video, if you've been on Twitter, you may have seen the endless debates about the power level of Moira and how annoying the damage orbs can be. Our friend Sam Mito has been the head of that battle to try to get 
low skill things out of Overwatch, which just goes for all heroes, not just Moira, but Moira's been kind of the focal point. And with that, Darwin made this genius workshop mod that improves Moira's coalescence to shoot an endless volley of damage orbs. This is pretty much the best thing we've ever seen and a pretty hilarious meme. Darwin, you're the real MVP for this one. And last up, for you workshop fans, fellow content creator, who I'm gonna be real, I'm not even try to pronounce this name. I know he plays a lot of Genji and makes good content, but he found a fully fledged Overwatch workshop zombies mode where you get points, upgrades, there are secrets hidden on the map, you work your way up to new characters, and it seemed pretty challenging. It's not like he just walked through it with his team either. So if you're looking for some early Overwatch 2-esque PvE gameplay, well, right there in the workshop, we've already had creators work towards that. And it is imagined that with Overwatch 2 adding a bunch more elements that the workshop also should get a buff from the PvE systems that should come with the sequel. But years down the line, we'll have to wait and see how that works out. But I'm excited to see it. But in any case, that's it for today's big news roundup video. If you did enjoy it, please be sure to leave it a like. It really does help us out and let us know that you're enjoying the content. And if you haven't already, please subscribe and be sure to hit the bell icon so that you actually get notified when our videos go live. Link to the description is our Twitter where we tweet out news, updates, and dank memes. That's been it for me. I've been Frito for your Overwatch. We'll see you guys next time.